What's up, my wizards? It's Dev. SBMTG down there on the YouTube.com. We like magic. And today, I'm going to give you my picks for the top 15 cards in Hour of Devastation. And yeah, I kind of felt like I did have to go above and beyond 10 cards here for this list. This set's kind of getting a bad rap. People are like, nah, this set's meh. I'm kind of sit this one out. I actually think there's a fair amount of playable cards in this set and some stuff to get really excited about. So, without further ado, let's hit it. But I can't do one of these lists without an honorable mention. You guys probably know to expect that from me by now. So with that in mind, this time around, it's Pride Sovereign. First of all, and most importantly, it's Kitty. And that means something to me. Along with the Dorned Pouncer, we saw some pretty good stuff for the cat deck, you know. Is it actually constructed playable? Maybe. <laughs> now we have a really good 2-drop really really good three drops so it's looking pretty decent and if this card stays out for any number of turns you know two three turns you're creating a lot of value so aside from it just being like one of my favorite cards because i like cats and i'm a weirdo it's also a playable card too same thing with the door and bouncer by the way it could just as easily be my honorable mention the card looks fairly strong honestly but that part's over so now it's time to get into number 15 the actual list starts with champion of wits it's hard to ignore a card with, like, so much built-in value, you know, the first time you play it for only three mana, mind you. That's not bad at all. You get a couple of cards, you discard a couple, put them in your graveyard. Maybe you're doing something with those later. We'll see. And then, after it dies, you can bring it back as an even bigger creature that gets you actual card advantage. Like, a body twice that gets bigger the second time gets you cards both times it comes into play. And is great for, like, reanimator strategies or any deck looking to, like, emerge Deep Fiend, like... It goes really, really good in a lot of different things right now, so I'm not sure that it's the best card in the set or anything. That's why it's number 15, but I do think it has some applications that'll probably make it standard playable. Moving along on the list, my number 14 is Hostile Desert. And some people might bristle because this is ahead of Champion of Wits and some other cards people might want to see that didn't make the list at all. So can't wait for the comment section. But as far as this goes, this goes you just can never count out a good creature land. And this may be one of those. And people are saying that you have to like build decks around this. Like, oh, this go really good in Gitrog. Like, yeah, it would go really awesome in that deck. But I don't think you have to have a bunch of targets to make this work. If you just have like cycling duels, or if you have like the cycling deserts, you know, then you can make this work pretty easily because you could have anywhere between like four and 10 cycling lands in your deck pretty easily and have a pretty good mana base. <laughs> so I don't think this is gonna be too hard to make work at all. And three, four is bigger than it would normally be. Like we would expect a two, two out of this, right? Well, three, four is actually a pretty freaking big creature. So I wouldn't be surprised if this had a presence going on, especially considering all the good creature lands rotate in a few months. And this might be the best choice we have. My number 13 is Ronus's Last Stand. And if I had to pick a best of the gods being killed cycle, it's probably this card. I know a lot of people like that blue one and a lot of people like that black one. But again, if I had to pick one that I would say would has a higher chance of seeing standard play than any of the other cards in that cycle, it's probably Ronus' last stand. And sure, you could play this on your turn two and then skip your next untap step. You've got pretty good initiative at that point. You've definitely got the biggest creature on the board, especially if you're on the play. So that seems good, but I think this is actually best played on turn four or five, where in an aggro deck, you're probably not going to be using all of your mana on the next turn anyway, and you'll have plenty of mana to use even if you tap a couple of lands down for a couple of turns. So honestly, I think this is really, really good in the mid-game, you know, turn four, turn five, that's when you would normally play a 5-4 anyway, but with this card, it gives you a chance to spend more mana on either another creature, way to protect this, whatever you want to do. So I think this is a really decent turn four play, and that might be where it sees the most action. But we'll have to wait and see. I do think this is a strong card for aggro, despite that I kind of ragged on it a little bit in the spoiler video. I wasn't a big fan, but the more I think about it, the more, especially you know when compared to the other cards in this cycle, I think that it might see some play. My number 12 is Abandoned Sarcophagus, and yeah, I know, this was my preview card. And I'm actually trying to be objective, um, and after going through an objectivity test with myself, I have checked myself, I still think this may be one of the better cards in the set, if only for fun factor. But the card is powerful no matter which way you slice it. That is a very, very powerful effect. And a lot of people are saying, oh, you play this turn three, and then you do, no, you don't. What you do is you set up your graveyard, and you play this on turn six turn seven and then your graveyard becomes your hand 
uh, which is probably the most powerful way to play this. And if we see a blue-white X cycling deck, then that's going to be how it plays Sarcophagus and probably won't play a whole bunch of them. Just the two of them will probably do it, especially in a deck that has a lot of one and two mana cycling cards. You're going to be able to draw into it fairly easily. But whether or not the card shines in a format full of artifact hate is another thing entirely. So I'm not really sure how much play the card sees, but... Even again, after trying to be as objective as possible, there is no denying that that is a very powerful first line of text. My number 11, sort of an honorable mention for the top 10, is Fraying Sanity here, which I actually think has a very good shot of seeing constructed play, believe it or not. Now, if you've been testing for this format on Cockatrice for the last few days, and not everyone does, but if you have, you've probably run into the mono blue, sometimes blue white mill deck. And it's actually looking pretty strong, if I say so myself. The deck is scary. And the entire reason that deck can function at all is fraying sanity. Really powerful, especially when you get a second one out. It's crazy. And the curve of, you know, basically this turn three and then startled away turn four is actually incredibly powerful. And in modern, we have the ability to go this turn three, traumatize. <laughs> That's also pretty good. <laughs> I could definitely see this making a splash in multiple formats. And honestly, from what I have seen of the deck, Mono Blue Mill could actually be real and will almost definitely be at least an FNM deck in this format. And I can't wait to cover it either. So really excited about this card. I think that more so even than um, Sphinx's Tutelage, it could make Mill very real, especially in a format where we're already set up with some pretty good stuff that Mills. Start of the Wake isn't the only thing. But number 10, we'll start the actual top 10 here with an uncommon Supreme Will. Now, this is already being tested in every control deck under the sun, and this is looking like it might be a control-oriented standard, either control or mid-range. We'll see which one wins the fight, but a lot of people are putting together control decks, and this is in literally all of them, whether it's blue-red, blue-white, Esper, Grixis. People are playing at least a two of Supreme Will and sometimes even four, because the card's choice is out of this world, man. Early game, being able to counter a spell is something every control deck wants to do, and the ability to counter some of these spells actually works until, like, turn seven in some matchups because they're casting six mana gear hulks in the mirror and five mana glory bringers against Mardu and stuff. So not a bad card even going on late into the game. And when you need to dig for a hard counter after it's like lost its relevance as a counter spell, you can do that. You can dig four cards and look for a disallow or something. So really powerful card, good at the end of the opponent's turn to find a gear hulk or something. Just so many different uses and it does two things. Control decks want to do already in one card. Very, very powerful, my friends. My number nine is Ramanap Excavator. And yeah, we'll get to some stuff that's not blue or green as the list descends here. Don't worry, there's better stuff in different colors. <laughs> but Ramanap Excavator is all the way up here at number nine, despite how cool it is and how amazing that line of text is right there in that text box. Um, <laughs> because it is, again, very killable. You know, this guy's the bolt and everything else. Um, in modern, it dies to a lot of stuff in standard. And I know that dies to removal isn't the best argument, but when it dies to a bunch of removal, it becomes a good argument. And honestly, I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to keep this Magus of the Crucible, basically, um, out. You know, it's going to be decent in decks that really want to play it. Again, Yitrog Monster looks pretty sweet right about now for the next few months while we still have it. Sad, but still. While we still have it, <laughs> Gitrog decks are looking pretty sweet because of stuff like this, and this could certainly see play in modern. This allows us to play, like, um, all of our cycling lands out of our graveyard. Looks pretty sweet in the Deserts deck, you know. Just a lot of fun applications, but also some competitive applications. So, can't wait to see what the card does, but it's all the way up here on the list because I'm not 100% sure that it'll do anything. But if it does, it's going to be pretty awesome. My number eight is the Scarab God. This is, again, a really, really powerful looking card that we're just not sure of. As far as control finishers go, if it's going to be five mana, we'd really like it to not be sorcery speed. We'd really like the creature to have flash or something. You know, right now we've got Archangel Abyssin, we've got Torrential Gear Hulk. So just not um, sure in the end that this will see mainstream play, although... I've been messing around with it in um, Solar Flare in the, the Blue Black X Reanimator deck. I've been messing around with it, and it's definitely something that you at least want a one of in that deck. Not sure that it sees a whole lot of play outside of that, and I'm not sure that it'll head up the top end of Zombies. I think that Mastery is probably still a better card for that. But if the card does find a real home and a really competitive deck, it's going to be a force to be reckoned with, man. Five mana keeps coming back 
for that investment, that's not bad at all. And it lets you just like reanimate whatever creature in any graveyard. Like that's just all the things the card does are so powerful and those scries are more important than you might think too. I had to choose a best of the forgotten god cycle. I would say this is the standout. Love Scorpion God, love Locust God, but if one's going to see standard play, it's likely going to be this one. My number seven is Hollow One right here, and this is going to do something somewhere, <laughs> I would imagine. In standard, it goes really well with a bunch of stuff, you know, and any sort of heck bent deck, decks that want to play things like Hazaret, um, decks that want to just dump their whole hand, you know, they play like Blood Rage Brawler, Tormenting Voice, Cathartic Reunion. Those decks probably really, really want to play this, you know. Oh, they could also play a Lupin Prototype, Bomac Courier. I mean, the deck almost builds itself at this point, and this looks like a very strong card for that deck. Even in the cycling decks, you know, blue-white cycling, we've got a bunch of cards that cycle for just one mana. So you could play this for just a three mana investment for free. So, I mean, you can, you know, you invest three mana in cycling stuff, and then you just play this out of your hand for free. And I've compared it to Mirror Enforcer before, but the difference between those two cards is that Mirror Enforcer requires you to have a board presence if you want to play it for a discount. This you don't. You just have to have discarded stuff out of your hand or cycled some things. No board presence required. So it might be the better card at the end of the day. And Mirror Enforcer is a pretty sweet card to be compared to. My number six is another uncommon. There's actually three uncommons on this top ten list. Number six is Liliana's Defeat. Okay, so it's got basically everything except instant speed, but I'm not actually that worried about instant speed considering the casting cost is so low. Just one black mana to take care of any black creature or planeswalker that they like ever print ever again at least in modern you know and for standard we've got this for two whole years so any incredible black creature or planeswalker that they print is kept in check for just one black mana that is really the best deal imaginable so i am a huge fan of this card i think it's going to see play in multiple formats and it could even see legacy play people have been talking about that because apparently liliana of the veil vale is also good in that format. <laughs> so, But in modern, it takes out Death Shadow for one mana on your turn, yes, but it still takes out Death Shadow for one mana, and it kills Liliana of the Veil in that format when you need it to as well. So, And in standard, it just keeps cards in check. It could print a ridiculous Planeswalker, and it wouldn't matter. Wouldn't matter because we have a, a safety valve in this card. And yeah, this is probably, I think this is the last cycle <laughs> that we're looking at today. There's a lot of cycles in Hour of Devastation. Um, but again, as far as the you know Gatewatch being defeated cycle, this is again, I think the best one. I really, really like the white one too, especially considering in standard, that's going to maybe be yet another nail in Gideon's coffin. So big fan of that. But again, if I had to pick a best one, this one, because it's going to have a fair effect on a couple of different formats, at least, I think. We're in the middle of the top 10. Number five, is Hour of Devastation the card? Not the set, the whole set, but the card. That's, that's really, that's going to get annoying. And yeah, all the way up here, again, in Blue, Red, and Grix's control list, people have been reporting back that this card is very good. <laughs> you know, One of the problems with things like Fumigate and other board wipes, um, in this and any format, is that Planeswalkers are very, you know, uh, Planeswalkers allow easy recovery from those sweepers you know if you sweep them with a fumigate and they've got a gideon out then you did something but you're just kind of delaying the inevitable you know they're just going to be able to crank out dudes or swing with a five five for the rest of the game and it kind of doesn't matter this though will kill gideons it's actually a pretty clean answer to gideon it'll kill liliana's it'll kill chandra's it'll kill whatever you know except for bolus <laughs> obviously, but it'll kill nearly any planeswalker that you're having a problem with at any given time. And just that is fairly decent, but when you get to take out all the other creatures on the board at the same time, yeah, we'll play that for five mana, especially in a format that's shaping up to be, again, a little bit more mid-rangey, it looks like. We'll be playing, like, fair magic, where we just play creatures on curve, or we counter creatures on curve. That's what it looks like is probably going to happen in this format. So I'm looking forward to this card seeing a lot of play. You know, I'm looking at two Sweltering Suns, two Hour of Devastation main deck, and it's working out. So can't wait to see what effect this card has in the format because I think it's going to definitely have one. My number four is Nimble Obstructionist because it's got to be. First of all, I love that its initials are no. <laughs> it encounters an ability. That's pretty cool. We now have a full suite of counters that take care of things that are already on board, which is very important for control. 
and it doesn't necessarily have to be relegated to the sideboard. You know, it looks like you could get away with a couple of main deck copies of this because you could also play it as a removal or a threat even, you know. The card is just so versatile that you can play it with Flash to take out an opposing flyer and trade, and you'll be fine with that. Or, if you've controlled the game up to that point, this thing can get in 6-9 damage before the, they stabilize in any way and might be even, even able to take you all the way in a game. So, big fan of this and... You know, if there's more. In the Abandoned Sarcophagus deck, you could always cycle this away and then play it out of your graveyard. That seems like a pretty sweet thing to be able to do. And in that deck, you can even bounce it back to your hand with an Unsummon and cycle it again after you've played it out of your graveyard. So, a lot of cool tricks with this in Standard and stops a lot of stuff that we would like to stop. <laughs> Especially once it's on the board. We can't do anything about it. Now we can, so... Big fan of Nimble Obstructionist. I think this is definitely one of the most playable cards in the set. My number three might surprise you, and it's the last uncommon on the list. But there is an uncommon in the top three here, and it's Claim to Fame. Now, for me, it's pretty much all about the claim half of this card, you know. We have a sort of worse unearth in standard, and I think that's awesome, man. I will take that all day. That also means that for, like, the entire time this card is in standard, we have to be evaluating creatures that um, have casting costs two or less based on this card in some ways, you know. They print a really good two-drop the next couple of sets. One of the first things I'll say is, hey, you can cast claim and get this out of your graveyard, you know. So, big fan, be looking out for creatures at two and one mana cost, especially to have enter the battlefield triggers. Those will be really good with claims. So, just really huge fan of the fact that we have this awesome reanimation spell in standard for just one mana. And in modern, it's pretty exciting there, too. You can get goifs, you can get bobs out of your graveyard, you can get snapcaster mages, death shadow. There's just a hundred good targets for this in modern. So, really can't wait to see what the card does. And that's not even talking about the fame half of the card. The fame half is also really good in a reanimator strategy and synergizes with itself the way these aftermath cards tend to. But if you do want to cast both halves, it's only three mana. <laughs> it's not bad, man. And who says that you have to cast uh, fame on the creature you reanimated? In a reanimator build, you can always reanimate something that's like eight to ten power and then whoops, give it haste. That's just like so much versatility on this card, so much value on this card if they start printing amazing two drops. So, be on the lookout for those. This card has a lot of implications for not just now, but the future. A number two card, we're right on the corner here. Number two is Solemnity. Well, this is probably purely a sideboard card that we're looking at right here, and it's not very often, you know, it's pretty rare that a sideboard card makes it all the way up to number two, but you just have to look at the possible ramifications of a card like this in modern and standard, and you'll understand why it's all the way up here. First of all, energy counters. Those are... Those are gone as soon as you hit a solemnity, and that's going to be really important. If it didn't do anything, if it just said players can't get energy counters, it would probably still be a pretty important card in the standard format at the very least. So, like just that about it, but also plus one, plus one counters, minus one, minus one counters, which has a lot, a lot of significance in the modern format. Persist creatures, undying creatures and such. Like, that's just really powerful, especially in modern. This also works with um, poison counters. You know, um, infect decks are look to be really bad against this. So just could warp the entire world and place entirely, like, really, really powerful decks just completely out in the rain. So really like what this card could do. It's going to make sure that some strategies either don't get out of hand or existing strategies that are already a little bit out of hand, energy, black green energy, teamer energy, two of the best decks in the format, and like Infect is a scourge, especially at local modern events. So something like Solemnity, it looks like it could have a lot of very important implications on some really good decks. And my number one card of the set absolutely has to be, and I wouldn't have it any other way, Nick All Bolas. Gotta happen. First of all, you don't want to have Nick All mad at you. I'd be, I don't want to know what he'd do to me if I didn't make him the number one card. But um, second of all, the card is obviously incredibly stacked. Very, very powerful. And yeah, I know, it's a pretty high value card. A lot of mana to cast this freaking thing, but once you do have it out, it does everything. It's going to be very hard to lose the game once you have a Nicol Bolas on the battlefield. And a lot of the blue-red decks that are starting to become Grixis decks are just control decks that splash black specifically for Nicol Bolas. Some of them don't even play Fatal Push, you know, because all you need is Nicol. You win the game 
when he when when you stick him basically you stick a knuckle bolus you're gonna win and that ladies and gentlemen is my list i know i missed a bunch of cards that a lot of people liked so make sure that you scold me down there in the comment section just star and feather me for missing your favorite card and by the way i think that that speaks to the fact this set is pretty decent too you know there's gonna be a bunch of people in the comment section like why isn't dream stealer here and like a hundred other cards so a lot of people have pet cards from this set already and a lot of people have cards in the set they think are going to do really really well in standard play that i didn't include on this list sounds like a decent set to me honestly so let me know down there in the comments what i missed and let me know what i was wrong and right about all that stuff and it's almost time for decks the next time you see me on camera i will have a deck for you so with that in mind i got some options the deck that i probably want to show you the most at this point and is the most finished at this point is the Jeskai Cycling deck with Abandoned Sarcophagus. That deck is looking pretty slick, and I want to show that one to you. But I've got a number of control decks. I could show you the Grixis control, basically blue-red control that splashes black for Nicol Bolas and Fatal Push in my sideboard. So I got to play Fatal Push. But we could show you that control deck, or conversely, we could show you the Solar Flare deck, which ended up being Soul Tie, if you want to see that. Could do that. Now... We could also do eight alchemists, which is basically thermo alchemist and that new common card that does a damage whenever you cast um, a non-creature spell. It's basically a mono red burn deck with eight pingers in it. And that's going to be super duper cheap. So we could also show you that. On that note, there's a couple of really popular decks, from what I can tell, that you might want to see too. So, do you want to see the mill deck? Just the mill deck in the standard with Frank Sanity, or one that got an awful lot of traction in the comments section of my last video, Jund Hapatra. Jund minus one, minus one counters. I'm working on that one too, and if you guys want to see it, I can deliver. But for now, what you should do is like the video if you enjoyed the video. I hope you did. I know lists can be pretty divisive, but that just because my number one isn't your number one doesn't mean you didn't like the video. So hit thumbs up if you want to do that. You can also check us out on Twitter at SBMTG Dev, or you can support the upcoming Deck Tech season by checking out patreon.com slash SBMTG. Do all that stuff, and I will see you cats next time with a deck. I'm super excited to get into this Deck Tech season. By the way, sorry about the haircut. I'm Dev from SBMTG. Thanks for watching, my wizards.